Hi everyone, welcome to another Hatton's Model Railway Skills Cast, where we show you some of the skills and knowledge you need to really invent your model railway and build a brand new layout. Today, we're covering one of our most popular requested topics so far. We're doing part one of covering signals, mainly in the UK, but across the world too. We're starting with the more original system of semaphore signaling. I've got a lot of variety of different models here, and we'll be giving you a real beginner's guide today so you can understand the purpose of signals, the different terminology used for them too, and some ideas for where to put them on your layout. So if you have any particular questions regarding semaphore signaling, please do put them in the chat and I will answer them throughout the stream. But to give you a little bit of history to start off, when the first railways were brought in, the trains moved very slowly and there weren't that many trains about on the railways either. So there was no real need for signals. But as more and more trains came into operation at faster and faster speeds, they did need to be notified whether the line ahead was clear, whether there was another train in front of them or indeed a horse and cart or similar crossing the rails further down the line. Initially, policemen were employed to hold up lamps that were either red or green or other different colours based on the operator. But with train speeds increasing, they needed a more permanent system, either than policemen walking in front of the train or standing besides the rails, or even stopping and allowing the train to proceed through. These trains suddenly had to run non-stop and a full semaphore signalling system was born and introduced in the UK in the early 1840s. The systems pretty much remain the same since. You'll see a lot of familiar things here that have been around for nearly 200 years now and can still be seen quite often on the UK railway network in certain places. They have mainly been replaced by more modern signalling, such as colour light signals or radio signalling. But there's still a lot of hotspots in the UK, especially in the southwest and the northwest of England, where you can see the semaphore signals still in operation. So let's take a look at a few of the different types and terminologies that some of you have no doubt heard, but we'll make sure they're explained for you today. And if there's anything I don't cover, please do put it in the comments and I'll answer it on the stream too. Let's start by looking at the two I've got in front of me here. These are O-gauge signals, but they are actually what's known as home signals. So these are your basic stop and start signal. So you've got the horizontal arm there on the left, and that indicates stop. So you can't pass that signal without permission or for the signal to clear. In most cases, this will be a red arm that you can see and with a red light to the side too. Over on the right, the signal is now cleared. So think of this like a traffic light. You've now got a green light ready to proceed. And just in case you can't see that green light, you can also see that the semaphore arm has changed and this has gone downward. So this is now clear and the line in front of you is, to is OK to proceed on to so your train can carry on down the track. Now, you may have heard the terms upper and lower quadrant and thought, well, what does that mean? And this actually indicates the way that the signal goes when it shows clear. It will always show a horizontal bar universally for stop. And that will be on a red signal for a home signal. As you can see there, we have next to it here a lower quadrant signal. So when this clears, it goes from the, from the on position to what's known as the off or clear position. And that then indicates that the signal is clear and the line ahead you can proceed into. With the heading down, these were used more on the Great Western Railway and the Midland Railway and a couple of others. They favoured the design for clear going downwards, so they're known as the lower quadrant signal for going down into the lower quadrant. The upper quadrant was used by quite a lot more companies around the time, and these instead raise up when they clear. So they're known as upper quadrant signals as they head into the upper quadrant. Either way, they mean exactly the same thing. It just depends on which part of the world you see the signal in. Is it, if it's horizontal, can't go past it, it's a stop signal. If it goes up or down, it's a clear signal. You're allowed to proceed onto the next section of the line. So I'll just show you that diagram one more time. You can see the difference there again between the different starts of the signals so you can either proceed or you have to wait until permission to proceed and that can be for a number of reasons 
A signal may be protecting a level crossing, so the gates may be against you and you may need to wait for things to cross the tracks. Once the signal is clear, you know you can proceed. It may indicate that there is a train in front of you in what's known as the section. So the section in front of you may actually contain a train. And between that and the next signal is then known as a block. So then you are not allowed to proceed into that block until it is cleared. And then you know that you can go to the next signal and so on and so on and so on. And make sure you check them every time to know that you are allowed to drive past them, pretty much like traffic lights on a road. So then we come into distance signals. Now, why do we need a distance signal? Surely that's enough. We can drive up to the signals. We can check them as we go past and we know that they're either going to be stop or go. Surely that's easy enough. We don't need anything more complicated. Now, think about as the trains develop through the 19th century, they're getting faster and faster and faster, heavier, more goods on them, longer trains, a lot harder to start and a lot harder to stop. If you don't want that train to stop, you can't have it pulling up at every single signal, slowing down for them and not knowing whether it's going to be clear or not. You need to give some kind of distant indication that the signal is clear. Therefore, you have distant signals. Now, these actually repeat what the signal in front is showing. So these are usually between a quarter and three quarters of a mile in front of the signal that we've just covered, the home signal. And as you can see, there's two different variations here. The one on the left shows the same horizontal arm. So this is now showing a yellow signal, which is caution. The next signal is at stop. So you will need to slow down for the next signal as it will be telling you to stop. If you're looking at the signal on the right, you've got a green light again. And again, we're looking at a lower quadrant signal here. So this has gone down to show us that the line ahead is clear. And also that the next home signal is also clear too. So we've got a clear run ahead right through past the next home signal, which is the red type that we looked at here. So this acts as a distant indication to the driver that he doesn't need to slow down. The next signal is completely clear and they can proceed as per normal. So that really helps speed up trains and speed up railways across the world at that stage then. The invention of the distance signal pretty soon after the invention of the home signal allowed the driver to have advanced notification of what the signals were showing ahead along the line. And after that, it gets a little bit complicated, really. There were suddenly a lot more technical signals springing up. You can see here what's known as a signal gantry. This is where a selection of signals for all the different lines actually tower over the lines themselves rather than standing to the sides. So these particular signals cover four different lines. And we're looking here from the cab of a locomotive at this signal gantry. And you can see the third line across is actually clear. We've got both the home signal, the red signal at the top, and the distance signal clear too. So we know that not only is this signal clear, the next signal down the line is clear for us to proceed past also. So the driver can get up a really nice bit of speed and doesn't have to worry about slowing down for the next signal. And to show you a little bit of diagram about that work, of how that works, if you've got both signals together on a post, you can see that on the left, we've got the stop because the home, the red signal is telling us to stop. In the middle, you've got caution. This signal is clear, as we can see at the top. But the next signal, indicated by the yellow distant banner below, is telling us to stop. So we know that the next signal is going to stop for us. And the one on the right, as we just saw on that signal gantry there, is this signal is clear as is the next signal as well. That's indicated by the distant yellow signal below. So these particular colors, these particular shapes that you see with the red home signal and the yellow distant signal with the jagged end there came into use in the late 1840s. And that has been the system that's been in use ever since. These are now universally known symbols, not only in the UK, but further across the world. The system's in use in a lot of places in America and Australia, too. I've put a particular example here. The only difference you'll see is that the signals face the other way due to a lot more railways in the US being right-hand drive and right-hand running. 
So they go forwards on the right hand track rather than the left. So we're starting to get there with signals now. We know when to start, we know when to stop. We know what clear means, we know what on and off means. And we've even got distant signals, so we know what's coming up at the next signal too. What about if we need to change tracks? Surely that's a really important thing too. And then we are looking at models such as this and real life signals that are called junction signals. So these indicate that different tracks have different permissions for you to leave, whether you're proceeding down a different line or not. So you'll find two or more of these in certain places. And again, showing you a great example here, a really simple junction signal. You'll see this multiple unit has just passed a signal. The left-hand signal is showing clear and the right-hand signal is showing stop. So it is making a left turn and taking the left-hand route. And you'll see there just on the bottom right of that picture that the point indeed is set to go towards the left. So the train knows that it is taking the left-hand route and the signal has confirmed that for the driver. These otherwise work in exactly the same way where you've got the home and the distance signal showing that you are okay to proceed or you have to stop and wait for the signal there. But otherwise, it is just an indication of what which route you will take to. And you can see here in model form, one slightly higher and one slightly lower. What you'll generally find with a lot of operators is what they know as the main route is the higher signal. And what is the secondary route will be the lower signal. So if you're heading down a branch line, for example, and you either have the continuation of the branch line or you have a small siding that you might want to go into, you'll find that the small siding is on the lower signal. And then they do change as well. I think I've got an example somewhere, not to hand, unfortunately, but they can be higher or lower on each side to show whether the right hand or the left hand side is the main route that you can take. Another example of where you'll get those is on stations, certainly island platforms, where you'll get them at the same height. And this will indicate which platform the signal applies to. So they might be next to each other, but they are actually controlling two different tracks. So I'll show you one final type of signal that we see here. We've got a couple that we've looked at already there. Right in the distance, we can see a home signal, which is showing clear that our train is heading towards. To the right of that, a little bit closer, we can see another junction signal. This is coming the other way, so it's, cer it's certainly not allowed to pass that at the moment while there's a train heading towards it. But these two signals that are a little bit closer are slightly different designs, and these are known as bracket signals. I've got one right here in front of me, actually. Again, exactly the same as what we've just learned. We have home versions and distant versions, too. So the full instructions that I've just given you on when you can pass and when you can't are exactly the same. But these are slightly offset from the post purely to help people see them when they're getting a little closer. You're bound to find these on tight curves or at station platforms where you may have station canopies or roofs covering the way. These actually then lean out, as we saw in that image there, and go directly over the track rather than towards the sides. So the driver can see these a lot easier and a lot earlier and not have to worry about getting right up to the signal before they do see it. So those are the four major types of semaphore signals that you will see. Again, in the UK, ever since around the 1840s and across the world in quite a few different locations too. You've got the different styles of upper or lower quadrant. And if you're not quite sure which railway you want to model and whether they had upper or lower quadrant signals in your part of the world that you're choosing to model, do get in touch. You'll see on the product descriptions that they do describe them as either Great Western or LMS or Southern Railway. And they do give you some examples there of what and where you can use the different signals. But do take a look at some real life photographs too for a bit of inspiration there. As for looking at the actual models, there's quite a few different ones available, dependent how technical you want to get with your layout. You can either have the Hornby models, which come, you can motorize these, 
but you can also use them by hand as well. So if you wanted to actually change your signals yourselves, you can pull just on the side of the signals there and they will raise and lower as you wish. So you can operate them by hand. In N-Gage and some of the smaller double O-Gage models, we do actually have fully static signals. Now, these are just for decoration. They don't change, but they do come in at a really great price point of around £8 or so. So if you just want to get a lot of signals on your layout and you're not too fussed about them actually working, you can get these signals or the Hornby ones, which do work by hand, and they're up to about £18 each. Everything then is electric. These are all operated by switches. And then that will either raise or lower the signal arm, as we mentioned towards the start of the video, in the various different ways. You have multiple switches for the multiple junctions. You have the right motor in there to control whether the signal goes up or down too. And wiring signals is something we'll cover in a later video. You do get a lot of instructions in the manuals. And of course, we have manuals such as Pico's operating signals and points guides there too which are really worth a good closer look. So I hope I've covered pretty much everything for you there today, just to give you a basic idea of the major types of signals out there for the semaphore modelers. And this is appropriate for anyone modeling a railway right from the starting days of railways in the 1830s and 1840s. And there's still semaphore signals all across the UK today. As we saw previously, this is a rather modern train in South Wales, heading through past some great Western signals, which have been there for nearly 100 years. And again, another view there from South Wales with some more of those great Western signals on the branch line. So you can still see a lot of the upper and lower quadrant signals out there on the network. And of course, they have been in place throughout the steam era too. So do take a bit of a look at those. And of course, this isn't all there is for signals. There's huge amounts more. There's platform signals where they are a little bit shorter to sit on a platform, as you see there. There's also ground signals, which are very small little circular signals, which work in exactly the same way, but they're down on the ground. So used in shunting depots and yards, but otherwise they work in exactly the same fashion. And of course, there's colour light signals too, which started to replace these in the 1920s and are the main type of signal we see around today. Stay tuned for that video. That will be coming out and will be available on our channel. So have a look for that. But for now, I hope I've covered pretty much everything to give you a beginner's guide on semaphore signals. Obviously, if there's a little bit more you do want to know, don't hesitate to leave a comment on our video or get in touch with our customer experience team who would be more than happy to help you. I've put a link on our description for more information on all the models we have available right now. You can get working semaphore signals in N-Gage, O-Gage and double O-Gage too, of many, many different designs appropriate for most of the railways throughout the UK. If you want to make sure you're getting the perfect signal for your layout, or you're not quite sure what part of your layout you need to put certain signals at, please do get in touch and we're more than happy to give you some guidance on where you should have a home signal or a distant signal. But at the same time, some of what we've covered today should give you an idea of what the signals were for and where they should be located. Otherwise, I'll give you one last look through the diagrams that we had at the start of the video to show you the different positions of the signals. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Do stay tuned to our YouTube and Facebook page for more skills casts from Hattons and make sure to like and subscribe as well. Otherwise, thanks again for watching this video and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.